All right. Thank you, Yankee. Um, how many of you have heard of Singularity University? So why am I speaking? I'm, uh, um, so I'll skip this through this close. part. Uh, I'll skip through this part fairly quickly. Um, uh, we pivot around this fundamental idea, and, and I think this is an important one, which is where we, we, we're seeing the pace of the technology accelerate, and it's leaching into many other areas. Right? So 10 years ago, my $1,000 laptop had the equivalent computing power of the brain of an insect. Today, it's got the equivalent computing power of the brain of a mouse. In 10 years, it'll have the equivalent computing power of one human brain. And in 30 or 35 years, it'll have the computing power of 8 billion human brains. And the question is, what would we do with that? And we, have, we think we have a difficult time predicting technology and, and, having, uh, and where it will go. We know exactly that this took a building of computing power 20 years ago and that this will be the size of a blood cell in 20 years. And what we lack is the imagination as to what to do with it. Um, and what we're seeing is this extraordinary progress in computing power is driving this acceleration in a number of other fields. You all know Ray Kurzweil, I presume. Uh, he's on the board of MIT. Uh, Ray's fundamental observation was that once any domain or discipline becomes information enabled and is driven by informational properties, that it goes into an exponential growth path. Right? And he no identified those technologies that Yankee mentioned biotech, nanotech, medicine, computing, AI, robotics, all driven by this computing power. And he was struggling with this fact. Why is this curve so smooth? Why have we seen such a regular exponential progression over 100 years in computing power? Uh, and then he struck upon this idea that the information enablement of the, a domain or discipline brings it to that level. So for example, now that we've sequenced the human genome, Medicine is driven by those informational properties, and we're seeing the cost of gene sequencing drop to an unbelievable level. Right? It cost a billion dollars to sequence the first genome 12 years ago, uh, 400 million for the second one, about 50 million for the third one, I think it was 14 million for the fourth one, and so on. And does anybody know what it is today? A thousand or two thousand dollars, right? And that's just a staggering. We've never seen this pace of change. How do you build a product or service when the, when the price point is changing by an order of magnitude every year? And we're seeing this happen in multiple domains. Peter, of course, is the chairman of the XPRIZE and probably the real driver behind uh, uh, SU. Both, of course, MIT graduates uh, in, in deep ways. Three and a half years ago, we had a founding conference at, at uh, NASA where we're hosted. And we brought together 50 or 60 thought leaders from around Silicon Valley to ask the question, is it worth creating an educational institution focused only on accelerating technologies? Um, so we have uh, Ray and Peter here. This is Chris Anderson from Wired. Uh, this is George Smoot, who's a Nobel Prize winner. This is me, Larry Page, behind me, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there were two interesting observations around this day. Larry Page got up and said, look, if you're bringing the top thinkers in the world together in these areas, then focus on the biggest problems. Right? We don't have enough smart, thoughtful people addressing some of our global challenges. And the, the thought that struck me that got me very interested, before this I was the head of innovation at uh, Yahoo, uh, and I was running their incubator and driving a lot of the product development there. The thought that struck me and the observation that got to me was, sorry, I rove around a lot, you're going to have trouble with that. All right. uh, was that when you look at some of our global challenges, the, the, the spread of a pandemic or aspects of climate change or the financial crisis was driven
addressing humanity, as you in this region know very, very well. Um, so the heart of our program is a 10-week uh, st graduate studies program. We also run a one-week executive program and some specialized program that, that uh, these other folks run. Um, as Yankee mentioned, our core technologies that we study are those we look at the uh, future studies, design, finance, and entrepreneurship, et cetera, as ways to manage all those technologies. Uh, and we think of energy and application systems and space and so on as how would you deploy, where would you deploy these technologies? The big challenge we had when we started was the curricular challenge. How do you take very, very broad subject areas, squeeze them into a short summer, and deliver any value? Uh, we've attracted some of the top thinkers in the world to come and speak uh, at SU, whether it's Vin Cerf or Dean Kamen or Craig Venter, um, and, um, and for each of the domains, we have a track chair that orchestrates the curriculum with the rest of their advisors. Uh, uh, Daniel Kraft, who from, runs the stem cell lab at, at uh, Stanford. Dan Berry, our head of faculty over on the top left, is a three-time space shuttle astronaut and an MD, PhD, and, uh, and an expert in robotics. And what's interesting to these folks is that you can be a global expert like Ralph Merkel in nanotechnology, but the disruption and the breakthroughs are happening between the cracks, right? between AI and medicine, or between robotics and manufacturing. And, and to explore those adjacencies is important. Um, we piloted this program in 2009 with 40 students uh, to see if the model worked, because nobody had ever attempted this before. Uh, we grew to 80 students in 2010. Last year, we had 2,200 applicants from 109 countries fighting over the 80 slots. We look for graduate students that have shown academic excellence, they've done something entrepreneurial or leadership oriented, and they're committed and interested in global challenges. They come in at the beginning of the week, we give them a bit of a crash course on what are the grand challenges. We bring in USAID, the World Bank, the, the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, and they talk about what's been tried, what's failed, what solution vectors look interesting in clean water and climate change and pandemics and public health, education, poverty, security. The, over the course of the 10 weeks, the students get about 300 hours of lectures from 160 different speakers on what's the future of each of these fields. Unlike most academics, which focuses on what happened in the past, how did this model evolve, how did this equation develop, we spend about 80% of our curriculum looking forward. What's in the labs today? What's going to be commercialized tomorrow? Where are these fields converging? What inflection points do you watch out for? Who are the top thought leaders? Who are the labs and, and companies doing interesting work? The second half of the summer, we turn it into an incubator. And we do, we do what's called the 10th and the 9th project. And the students cluster into teams, pivoting around one of the grand challenges, and focus on a project. Their objective is come up with a product or service that would impact a billion people within 10 years. You have three weeks, off you go. Report back. Um, at the end of the summer, we launch them as NGOs or research initiatives or for-profit companies. Uh, we've done about 25 of these, a couple of examples uh, this team looked at the rise of 3D printing and control systems and, ro and robotics. Uh, how many of you are familiar with 3D printing? A lot of people, most of you? Okay, great. Um, 3D printing, the robotics, control systems, all growing very dramatically. They looked at the construction industry and noticed, you know, the way we build houses today fundamentally hasn't changed in 5,000 years. And so they designed a giant car wash looking thing that will 3D print a house in a day and a half. And they've got it to a point where they can fabricate a, a three-meter load-bearing wall, uh, and they're expanding that to do a full house. Um, this team from this last year looked, was looking at poverty, and they noticed that in Africa there's a billion people that don't have access to roads because a lot of the roads get washed out during the wet season. How do you alleviate poverty when you can't physically move goods and services around? And so in the middle of the summer, Chris Anderson from Wired magazine came and did a talk on drones. He's doing a whole open-source hobbyist DIY maker movement on these quadcopter toys. Uh, and they looked at this and they noticed, you know, Africa in telephony, Africa skipped entirely over the wireline generation and went straight to wireless, right? Well, they're never really going to have the money to put roads in. So what if they use this kind of capability to move food and medicine around and skip over because you don't have to have physical infrastructure in the same way? So they designed what they call the MatterNet, which is actually a physical IP address system for things. So a drone would pick up a package, take it a few kilometers, park itself, recharge. The next one would pick it up, car <coughs> carry it over a mountain, etc. Uh, in their initial estimate, they thought that they could get the cost down to six cents per kilo per kilometer, which is the cheapest that exists in Africa already. Um, so they're the, they're already working with the Dominican Republic to pilot this idea. Uh, Get around, which was our very first startup, does peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. 
uh, whereas it costs $30,000 for every zip car to go onto the road, um, their car sharing device is $150 to do peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. So you walk up to the car, request access, you get, uh, you open it with your iPhone, start the car with the iPhone and drive away. Um, so we've done about 25 of these over the three years. About half of them are still alive. Many of those have gotten funded. Um, Larry Page comes and spends time with the students uh, every summer. Uh, the most interesting attribute, I think, and specifically for this group, is we, because we focus on the fastest moving technologies, for example, biotech today is quite different from a, a year ago even, because there have been several major breakthroughs in biotech. It forces us several times a year to gather our entire faculty and we revisit the entire curriculum. Before every program, we revisit every lecture because we have to. And this causes an interesting structural problem. Although we have the best lecturers in the world coming from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, Oxford, etc., we cannot become an accredited official educational, government sanctioned educational institution because to do so, you have to fix your curriculum and not change it. <laughs> right? Now, we're clearly an outlying edge case, but this pauses actually has raised a general question, which is how does any regulatory framework keep pace as technology is accelerating away from us? We've lost the entire digital music DRM copyright battle. The intellectual property system, patent system, fundamentally broken. Privacy is washing away in front of our eyes with very little public discourse. And how do we manage this in the future as we grow? So this is an interesting question that we're faced with. Uh, our executive program is focused more on the existing leadership, CEOs, CTOs, investors, etc. And the idea here is it used to take 20 years to create a billion dollar opportunity. We're seeing that happen in months today, right? The metabolism of the economy is actually increasing. And orthogonal technologies are coming into industries and disrupting them pretty fundamentally. If you're the CEO of a major company and you do not have a sense of what technologies may disrupt your industry, you're not doing your job. You end up as Kodak or RIM or Nokia or Yahoo, right? And so here we focus on uh, uh, areas where we, we, each executive takes their vertical, their discipline, and they take the 30 or 40 major breakthroughs that we see across all of these different areas and see how does that apply to their domain, their discipline, their product area. Um, and as Yankee mentioned, we focus on fast growth. We focus on the concept that we could have abundance in many areas. Before we had uh, digital cameras, we had scarcity by camera film in terms of how many photographs you could take. It was linear, it was very limited. We now have, maybe that's not a good thing, but we have an absolute abundance of photo photographs today, right? Uh, and we're seeing the same thing as Facebook has digitized our relationships. It's freed up our inter interactions between people and now we have absolute frenetic energy of connecting with people. How do you look forward and not look back? The, the past has become, is becoming less and less of an indicator of what will happen in the future. And this is where a dynamic they're seeing. And then, of course, there's the entrepreneurial and collaborative thing is the engine that makes, this, that makes this go. Essentially, we're creating a crucible. And into that crucible, we're putting the top thinkers in the world and the fastest moving technologies, adding into it the most ambitious yet next generation of young leaders and existing leadership, and pointing people at the biggest opportunities. Something interesting will happen, and we've started, we're starting to see that. We're starting to get attention uh, around the world. Um, the World Expo that was in Shanghai a couple of years ago will be in Milan in three years, and we're driving a lot of the technology thinking for that. And I want to come back to this uh, idea. I mentioned that our brains don't operate this way, right? And our leadership in the world, especially political, does not understand this. And we're seeing that in high, sharp relief in the oh. Ar Arab Spring. Oh. Where a new generation of, of a younger generation is leveraging technology and communications in the, in the way that the older generation just simply cannot conceive of. And their only way of trying to deal with it is just to actually kill it or, sh or shut it down or kill its citizens, as we're seeing in Syria today. Um, uh, but fundamentally, the underlying dynamic again is we're driving, turning a lot of this into information. We're turning our world and we're expanding the human experience using information technology. Our, our memories exist in these devices now. They're not in our heads anymore. Right? It's freeing up a lot of neurons to do other types of work. Now, if I look at this graph with the amount of information created, notice that Google has created a $200 billion company by essentially manipulating text and now, and now video. Facebook, a $100 billion company by digitizing relationships. 
uh, Groupon and Foursquare addressing the $100 billion yellow pages arena. Uh, thank God somebody's doing it. Um, and as we get forward, we're seeing unbelievable explosion in the amount of information that's being uh, created. Um, we have in the Internet of Things space, we have today about 2 billion connected devices. And current projections show that by about 2050, we may have up to a trillion connected devices on, on the Internet. And we're creating the first nervous system for the world with mobiles, uh, mobiles and sensors in them as edge points for, the, for gathering all those data. Now, value is being created by uh, aggregating, manipulating, and creating value out of all of that massive amount of information. Apple, 80% of their revenues come from products that did not exist five years ago. I still have trouble wrapping my head around that fact. So as we think about where the future goes, it's going to come in the arena of manipulating huge amounts of information. We're pretty clear about that. And Peter says the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. I actually think uh, uh, the only way of predicting the future is to create it yourself. Uh, Yankee's graph was a little nicer and more colorful than mine, but roughly shows the same thing. Um, but, and he shows that the, the amount of technology, the effect of technologies in our lives has been quite incredible. Um, and a little uh, idea around this, this uh, how much information is being created. Eric Schmidt uh, talked about this. Uh, five exabytes is just a huge amount of information. We created five exabytes from the beginning of time to 2003. Today we're doing that in two days, five exabytes of information. And by next year we'll be doing that in ten minutes. And this pace of change is what we're all struggling with. But in that pace of change, we have extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity. Um, I'll go back to 3D printing for a minute. Um, these printers used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and were used by designers and architects to make very complex models. And then they started dropping in price. There were tens of thousands of dollars. That's a $2,000 printer that will fabricate 70% of the parts to make the next printer. Right? Um, this is a, now the inflection point that we highlight in 3D printing is that it used to be when you wanted to make a more complex object, a more complex design and manufacture it, it cost more in molding, fabrication, assembly, etc. For the first time in our history, complexity is free. If I can imagine an extremely complex object, the printer does not care, it just fabricates it. The seven nested spheres in this thing cannot be molded. They rattle around like Russian dolls. You can make fully. They're, they're actually at a point where I've seen a 3D pr uh, printed bicycle formed out of one print, and then the person gets on the bike and rides away. Okay? Down at the bottom middle there, that's titanium. We are now got to the point where we can 3D print and fabricate metal objects. Fully formed gears and ball joints with no assembly. That's a woman's shoe. If you break a heel, you just print a new one. And over there on the left is food. We're starting to 3D print food now and assemble food. Now we're totally into 3D uh, Star Trek type of territory. One question I have from an economics point of view is these are the cheapest printers now are about $700. In about five to seven years, they'll be as cheap as laser printers and we'll have them in our homes. We'll be printing toys and toothbrushes and replacement parts, etc. What happens to the Chinese manufacturing economy that's completely driven by making cheap plastic parts? And it's not necessarily a good thing for the world economy because they're going to start asking for their debt. <laughs> so I come back to this. You know, this part of the world is linear. Our regulatory frameworks, our legal systems, and part of the world is growing very, very exponentially, very, very fast. And the aspects of that, the world that are growing fast, is actually increasing. And that's causing a huge amount of disruption and opportunity. And as entrepreneurs, or as you think about the future, it's all, every time I look at it, it's always in the... Where do you manage information? Where can you take a domain and turn it more into information? Thank you very much. I have a couple of minutes for questions while we get Daniel uh, up to talk about medicine. The next two speakers are going to give you a little slice in medicine and in biotech and talk about what are the things that are happening there. And keep in mind the framing that we're using. But does anybody have any questions? Yeah. You said there were 2,000 applicants to 
how many do we receive? Eighty. Our capacity is eighty. It's linear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so to respond to that, what we're doing is we're running contests around the world to find great suits and pushing the processing out to the edges. Um, we piloted it two years ago. Last summer we ran 12 contests around the world to find great students. Uh, this year we're doing 20. There's a question back there and then we'll come here. Yeah. yeah I wanted to ask, uh, because uh, you talk about the future uh, only uh, regarding technology. Yeah. But there is something very uh, different between the human race and uh, the machine. What about the social interaction? Because you know, Google, uh, Facebook, everybody says, you know when we when the telephone first came out um, there were all sorts of analyses saying it would destroy relationships because there's no face-to-face -face interaction if I can talk to somebody over the phone I'll never go meet anybody ever again and we found that not to be true and the same thing happened with email so when will we ever talk when we see the kids today, they're only texting, right? They're never actually speaking. We wonder what that's like. Sorry, I'll try and use the mic. Poor AV guys going crazy. Um, let me try and use a little discipline. All right, so I'm going to have to stand in one space. This requires a lot of discipline. Um, so uh, uh, we've seen repeatedly as we add communications channels, we always get a little worried about it, but over time it actually enhances relationship, doesn't take it away. So today via Facebook, I can, for the first time in history, you can actually get to know somebody very well without having met them. <coughs> Whether that's a good thing or not, I, it's, I, I won't make a value judgment, right? I live in now, a different world than you, but uh, I suppose you are in a... Well, I look, I look at the kids today, right? Uh, what was the stat that somebody said? Nobody under 25 ever has their phone on ring. It's always only on vibrate, <laughs> right? I mean, they don't actually talk to anybody. They just text. And at one level, there's part of me that goes, my God, what's happening to that caliber of interaction? Uh, but they'll probably figure it out. We did. Our parents were scared of us, you know, just always talking on the phone. Uh, and so I think uh, I tend to be more of an optimist if it hasn't come across. It's a different world uh, today. If you want, I'll speak with you outside. And please. I'm, I'm in the middle of the age. And it's yes. a really different world, and it's very... So that does cause a lot of stress. So that does cause a lot of stress. A hundred years ago... A parent's generation and a kid's generation led somewhat similar lives. Today we're living very different lives and, and the, our kids' children will have a completely different set of lives. When you hear these next two speakers, I think that will come out in even more sharp relief and then we can have the conversation. Yeah? How many of your graduates are actually in effectively leadership positions? Um, how many are they in leadership positions? We try and select future leaders. Uh, but many are in existing. They've all done something entrepreneurial or leadership oriented. Uh, out of the 80 students last year, they had maybe 160 graduate degrees amongst them. Uh, they started on average three companies each. Uh, it's quite a. With respect, that's not leadership addressing the fundamental issues of energy and food. You can have information coming out of the years. Can we get? Can it and it won't warm you or cool you. Can we come back to that? Can, let's come back to that in the, in the panel discussion. I'd like to bring on board uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel's going to give us a little overview of what's happening in medicine. Uh, so, Daniel Kraft, welcome. Okay. 